Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. And the recommendation for, night, for tonight's speaker came from Danny Hillis, who is co-founder and co-chair of the Long Now Foundation and the designer of the 10,000-year clock we're installing in West Texas. And he has 300 patents uh, invented was a large part of inventing massive parallel processing and uh, MetaWeb, which is part of how Google Search actually works, and things like the pinch that you do to make things larger and smaller on your iPhone. That all comes from Danny. He is particularly interested in how the internet and everything else having to do with the infrastructure, info structure of civilization going forward can best go forward. And so that's why he strongly recommended the speaker tonight, who is in the thick of that in various respects. Please welcome Juan Benet. Thank you for hosting me tonight. It's a huge honor for me uh, to be here with you today and to be introduced by Stuart Brand. Uh, thank you for being you, Stuart. <laughs> My name is Juan, uh, and I'm from Earth. More specifically, I'm from the internet. Uh, from 1995 to 2018, mostly, that's most of the mimetic uh, things that are flowing in my brain. And uh, I am a product of your work. I'm a product of the work of the people in this room and watching this stream. Uh, thanks to you, to your actions, your thoughts, your memes, I am who I am today. Uh, my learning and my capabilities have been shaped by, by what you've done, the technologies that you built, the systems that you designed and deployed, and the thought that you left us or you gave us. So for me, this is really about getting to discuss important matters with my mimetic family, uh, with my broader tribe, and without exaggeration, with uh, many of my heroes. Uh, so thank you, Stuart. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Thank you, Danny, for uh, inviting me to, to this place. And thank you so many of you who are here today who care about thinking in the long term, who care about these systems, who care about where humanity is headed, uh, who don't have your head in the sand, so to speak, uh, and uh, who are, are here with us to, to think a little bit broader. Uh, so today I'm not giving just a seminar, but I'm giving a hyper seminar. So that means that we'll be going through at hyper speed uh, <laughs> and through many things and many times. Uh, but more importantly, it is to mean that it, it is aimed to be consumed as hyper media, interlinked and intertwinkled with everything else. Most of the audience for this discussion are actually, actually in the future, people that will watch this for years to come. Hopefully, if it's any good. <laughs> so for those unfamiliar with hyperseminars, let me give you a few pointers. I am not going to explain everything. Uh, that would take me a century, and I would do a terrible job of it. So there are many better teachers that have existed and many better explanations that are at your reach. Uh, so I invite you to pause and go look at something else along the way. Now, your best viewer will be a computer capable of playing the audio and video stream, perhaps with captions in your favorite language, or with controls to pause the stream, speed it up or slow it down as you see fit. The 20 teens web, uh, or better, will do just fine. Uh, if you are with me in the physical room today, you probably can do all of that. Uh, so don't worry, it's OK, because you'll get enough context. You are living here with me in my time, so you're probably familiar with most of the things you'll see. And you'll be able to rewatch this later on. Uh, it's a, a plug for you to become a member of the Long Now so you can watch it in HD. <laughs> uh, you also get to ask me things in person afterward, which hopefully that'll make, uh, you know, make amends for you not being able to pause me in mid-flight and then go look up something. Uh, so one last note. Once recorded, I hope to go back through this hyper-seminar and annotate and link the hell out of it. <laughs> Uh, maybe with tools like Hypothesis or Fermat's Library or other things that you might make. 
Uh, that will take some time to do, and so don't expect it at the same time as the audio and video uh, for this drops. But perhaps in the future, maybe in a few days, a few months, a few years, uh, we'll have it. Certainly, you know, before the long now is passed. Uh, <laughs> So with logistics out of the way, some preliminary thoughts. I try to see our multiverse through many different lenses, though I often fail. This talk will survey many things and many times, as I said, and it is meant to be a mimetic four-course dinner. Uh, it aims to raise questions more than answer anything. It is meant to remind us to have more perspective, uh, and it will sound some dire alarm bells that I'm quite worried about. But it's also meant to comfort, uh, to comfort, comfort, uh, <laughs> I was actually born in Mexico, so uh, that my accent sometimes comes out. Uh, and to give us a sense of excitement, uh, I, want to, I want you to leave this conversation uh, inspired to work on something. So I will relate some stories unfolding now and tell you about some new magical technologies that are, that are growing, and I'll try to inspire you to do something, uh, and so that's why we'll start with some perspective setting. Now, I will have, I hope to do a lot, and I will probably fail at some of it, but give me your feedback later on, and I will get better. So hopefully, in the future, I'll do this again, and uh, more people in the future will benefit. So with all of this set up out of the way, let's get to it. First course, let's get some perspective. I'll take you through a couple of quick exercises just to get us on the same page. I need you to shake out of your day-to-day -day and think much broader. The first one is very easy. So let's just look through a few images uh, just to get us on the same page. Now, I'll try this again, and uh, this was not quite um, at the speed that is signaled there. It would take us a lot longer. Uh, but uh, I, I can't even try to do it um, you know, proportionally. Uh, I could try to like, do it log proportionally, maybe. Uh, so let's try it like, once more. <laughs> I guess technically this happened very quickly, my mistake. <laughs> It's taking too long. Let's speed up a little bit. <laughs> Took a long, long time uh, between the formation of our galaxy to the formation of our sun. Or so I'm told. I haven't personally verified the fact, but uh, so far the explanations fit with all of our other frameworks, so it seems to check out. Actually, it didn't look like that. It looked more like that. And, and quite quickly, we, got, we think we got the first few organics um, and unicellular systems. I think this is probably a few a billion years off or something. Uh, this transition to go to uh, pluricellular things, oh, sorry, uh, eukaryotes took a while. Like, think about that, you know, um, 3.5 to 2.1 billion years ago. A billion years just go to go from unicellular things to eukaryotes. Uh, even if that's off by, say, 500 billion years, still a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Think about that, 230 million years ago, dinosaurs. <laughs> 230 million, million years ago. Think about how much happens in a day and how much happens in a year and how fast the world changes. Uh, it's absurd that the world was so, so similar for so long. We're really young. I am totally not following the, the right timing, but you get the idea. This all happened like really quickly, right? So here, here's, another, here's another way to look at it. Um, this is a little bit of a different exercise. Uh, and, and by the way, I think that this is, both of these exercises are best done by picking a time scale, something like a day, a week, a month, a year maybe, and then mapping that time scale to that day, week, and so on proportionally, 
and just try to put yourself through that experience, to the, through the experience of uh, seeing gal you know, the galaxy forming for a long time, way before our sun happened, or uh, the Earth appearing and maybe the first few life forms, and waiting for a very, very long time before uh, you get to, to more complex forms of life. Uh, I have to thank Carl Sagan for this, because thanks to Cosmos, I got to understand this. Uh, I wouldn't have been uh, that clear otherwise. So the second exercise I want to do is similar, but we'll look at it all in context. So a million, about a million years ago, fire and stone tools. 100,000 years ago, cave paintings and more advanced language. 10,000 years ago, writing, agriculture, farming, and so on. 1,000 years ago, science, the printing press, the enlightenment, Newton's laws, and so forth. 100 years ago, steam power, railroads, the lightning bulb, the telegraph, um, cars, airplanes, the computer, the bomb, the internet, the Xerox Alto, the Unix, the web, Google, Wikipedia. Oh yeah, that's where those are. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, the cloud, mobile phones, optogenetics. Um, there we go. Uh, 10 years ago, the cloud, mobile phones, optogenetics, CRISPR, autonomous cars, machine learning, blockchain systems, polar bears dying out, uh, and so on. So that's pretty striking. Um, even in a log plot, it's fast. Uh, it really, what's going on right now is really different from anything that, has, that we know has happened before. Um, and it's even crazier when you try to think about it going in the other direction. So indulge me <laughs> a little bit and uh, you know, in some wild speculation. Let's try to go forward in time as far as we can. So within 10 years, maybe virtual reality, augmented reality, more automation, people in Mars, we hope. Within 100 years, more drastically biomechanical, mechanic, biomechanically augmented humans, maybe artificial general intelligence, maybe uploads, maybe colonies on Mars, uh, and hopefully uh, nanotechnology. Within 1,000 years, um, yeah, within 1,000 years, more interplanetary travel, warp drives, AGI, Eden, or hell, uh, potential ac apocalypse, who knows. Uh, <laughs> within 10,000 years, uh, Dyson spheres, maybe, interstellar travel, I don't know. Within 100,000 years, maybe our own von Neumann probes, uh, I don't know. Within a, a million years, we just completely lose the ability to just think about this, because what's going on, what we're part of, is something so profound so different from the rest of what we see in space, the, the rest of the static stuff that we see in space, so profoundly different um, that we are changing the universe in ways that uh, we cannot foresee at all what we'll, what we'll do. So it is, um, it's really hard to understand what's coming. It's really hard to know what's coming even around the corner, something like 25 years from now, 50 years from now, and so on. And so this is exciting, uh, but also terrifying, because it can go very wrong. Um, and the, the last um, perspective setting, oh yeah, one, one, one thing. Uh, as the Android, Android David says from, uh, from the movie Prometheus, big things have small beginnings. And so when you think of all of the things that, that you associate with humanity and with technology and so on, and even going back to the beginnings of life, all of, the, all of this it has had quite a small beginning. And so it's hard to predict. Not only hard to predict, but it's hard to, to estimate the value of something. It's, it's really hard to understand how things will turn out over time. We can only go for it and try to guide it along the way and make sure that it doesn't go in, in bad directions and make sure to, as much as possible, steer the ship in the right directions. But what I want you to take away from this is things are being played with right now that, um, that are presenting some radical changes to what it means to be human uh, in ways that you know, even the, techno the astounding technologies of 100 or 1,000 years ago um, are, are barely going to compare to. So with that, uh, you know, there is danger. Uh, <laughs> There is a lot of danger with this. So there are some very, very big challenges. So we could blow ourselves up. We, of course, could be subject to some random cosmic disaster, um, something you could go wrong with some um, viruses, whether it's by our own doing or not. Uh, we could be the re recipients of some other von Neumann probes. Uh, who knows? Uh, we could have, you know, AIs could go bad. Uploads could go bad. I'm actually more worried about bad uploads and bad AIs. Uh, <laughs> You know, the devil you know, it might be more likely than 
than you know, some randomly sampled intelligence going bad. Um, we can, we're you know, destroying our planet, as we, or destroying our version, or our, what we think our planet is, uh, and so on. So I like to think about this in terms of the doomsday index. Uh, and so this is a little bit of like a, you know, kind of a silly thinking tool. Um, but uh, it's, think of it as, as another one, as another exercise. Um, so consider for a moment um, how much money it would take to annihilate all of humanity if you know, some uh, nefarious individual or small organization wanted to do that. So just think about it for a moment and think of like what, what you would guess uh, you know, at these, each of these timescales uh, it would have cost. So I would guess that you know, 10,000 years ago, nobody could have done it. Uh, even if uh, people tried, uh, they, couldn't, they just couldn't do it. Even 1,000 years ago with powerful empires, they couldn't have gone around uh, and, and actually found all of all, all humans um, and killed everybody. Uh, even a hundred years ago, with the you know extremely powerful powers of those days, uh, it was quite difficult to to get to that point. Uh, but something happened uh, in 1945. We unlocked an extraordinary, extraordinarily powerful thing, uh, and then we. Uh, mass produced, or not quite mass produced it, but produced a lot of it, uh, and stockpiled it and made much more efficient systems. So I claim that you know, around you know, in 1945 through 1960, it could have cost somewhere in the order of hundreds of billions of dollars to build a nuclear program and, and do that. Now, whether or not you can wipe out all of humanity by uh, nuking everything uh, remains to be seen. I'd rather not see that. So. Uh, <laughs> But what's worrisome is that this is still decreasing. Uh, recent questions around um, biotechnology um, and the potential ills that could come from um, engineered viruses and so on make this number go down. And so I've, I've been curious about this question for quite, quite a while as to what, what exactly is the is a number today. Some people as, have told me that they estimate this to be in the tens to hundreds of millions, which is quite low. Uh, some people think it's much, much larger than this. Some people just think, you know, even if, with all of the money in the world, you couldn't convince, um, you know, even 10 people to go through, the, through with this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know where reality lies. Is it over here? Is it down here? Um, but I would certainly really like it to be up here. <laughs> uh, so I really want to make sure that we don't screw this up. Uh, we just saw how long it took to get here. We have an extraordinarily lucky, um, we're, we're part of an extraordinarily uh, lucky thing. We don't even have a word for this. What is it that we are? Like, be, be, think beyond our species or our, intel, our, you know, our civilization or our life tree or our planet or our galaxy. Uh, we're, part of the, we're, we're an extremely lucky part of the universe. Uh, and yes, we are the universe awakening uh, to know ourselves, but we certainly could, uh, screw part of it up. We certainly can't blow up the universe, thankfully, uh, but we could do something to set us ourselves back at least another 300 million years, like that, you know, back to the dinosaur time and, and back here. Thankfully, I don't think we, we are even remotely capable of wiping out life on Earth. It's great, this is why I sleep soundly at night. Uh, but, but I do think it is very possible for ourselves uh, to wipe out uh, ourselves like humans. So we should you know, be careful with these things because you know, this is the budget of uh, most, this, this is the yearly budget of all countries, uh, or like in the top countries, and they can all afford um, the doomsday index. Uh, so you know, every, you know, some, it's very hard to have a country go rogue like that, uh, but hey, maybe, maybe they could. Or what about you know, people, individual humans? Um, you know, this is the Forbes 1000, uh, I think, Richest people, like you know, some, the leaderboard of the richest people, and it's a, a surprisingly um, large amount of money compared to you know these numbers that we were seeing before. So, so this coupled with like the you know what is the what is the incidence of sociopathy, right? Like, <laughs> how many of these people are going to go crazy and and try something bad? So, of course, um, you know nothing has happened so far. Uh, humans are fine. Clearly, everything is okay, right? Uh, <laughs> Well, no, because as we saw here, we didn't have to worry about this 100 years ago. 
we have to worry about it now. Uh, so there's a lot of people that have you know, made, this, um, made this case much better than, than I am here or that I will. Uh, you know, and and you, know, you can look up, uh, you know, this is a great moment to pause and go look up X risks and you know, all the set of arguments and discussions on what are specific X risks that we should be worried about, how to mitigate them, uh, what people are working on this, and so on. But what I want to give you here is, is an idea that we should be working as hard as we can to get this number to go up, and we should be thinking of a bunch of ideas around that. So things like, hey, maybe we should be controlling some technologies. But hey, who controls the controllers? Can you trust your governments? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe not all governments. And certainly governments change. So what happens when those controllers um, switch to something else? So this is a big part of, so all of the blockchain world, in a sense, is a response to um, government controls over money. Uh, to, to a big degree, uh, beyond just the interest in digital currencies or cryptocurrencies, uh, the ethos of the entire blockchain movement is a concern that the powers that be might not be do, acting in the best interest of, of their people. So are we going to trust uh, you know, the entire, all of the governments on the planet to, to all behave correctly for all time? Uh, maybe not. And so maybe we need larger scale systems that can detect problems going on along the way. We could agree to not build some technologies. Probably won't work. Some people will do it at some point. Uh, and I think the key is in, in making it ridiculously hard or expensive uh, to wipe out humanity. Uh, this is kind of the cryptographer approach to this. You think of a security problem, and you say, how can you make it as ridiculously expensive as possible? Hopefully so expensive that you couldn't, um, you know, you couldn't do it if you tried for all time. Um, but hey, if you can at least raise the bar significantly to decrease the probability of someone doing this, then hey, that's good to do. And so yeah, this is very, very hard to do, but there are some ways. For example, replicating and backing ourselves up as soon as possible. Uh, so this is becoming interplanetary, right? And so uh, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Wouldn't you, don't we want this, like now? <laughs> so go, go SpaceX. Uh, so this will take a while, uh, but you know, it'll take a while to get this to be fully self-sustaining so that if something goes wrong on Earth, at least Mars will be safe. Um, you know, I, I, what, 50 years, 100 years? Uh, certainly way longer if you know, the people that uh, work on things like SpaceX and all of the other space companies weren't doing, weren't doing what they're doing. I want to point out, by the way, here when we're thinking about controlling some technologies, that today means the governments, the governments controlling all these technologies and deciding what, what happens with them. But hey, who's actually trying to get us to space and back ourselves up? It's not a government. <laughs> it's a corporation. <laughs> what? How is a corporation, a lot of people um, agreeing upon a singular mission with you know, equity and you know, financial markets involved and short-term Wall Street perspectives, you know, they're not public yet, but uh, you know, that th how is a thing like that actually you know, one of the best hopes today for our long-term survival? Um, why is NASA so underfunded? Why are all the space agencies around the planet so underfunded? This is ridiculous, and it should show that there's something really wrong going on with our governments. There's something really wrong with how we're prioritizing things, with how we're thinking about problems, with how we, who we elect, who we, um, who, who we make part of those conversations and what we're worried about. When you, when you tap into the Twitter stream today, the, the problems that people are arguing about don't even figure in these time scales that we're talking about at all. And so I want you to think about the problems in your daily life. And when you find yourself worrying about something that won't matter a year from now, or 10 years from now, or 100 years from now, Maybe, maybe you shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> so um, the last thing that I would you know, say we, we should do is convince everyone not to do this. Um, but you know, education has failed to contain even the flat, flat Earth movement. And we have a picture of the Earth, damn it. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> So, so we need drastically better knowledge distribution systems. I'm not even going to call it education, because education today just means school. And, and I really just mean we need to rethink drastically how we get humans to know things. Uh, anyway, I want to leave you with two options and then switch to the tech stuff, because you know, enough, enough perspective setting. Uh, it's all kind of scary and, and downer. Uh, uh, so uh, you can either go extinct. Or you, can, or you can not go extinct. <laughs> and uh, those really translate to 
either you do nothing, or you do the average day to day, or you get trapped in like the you know, milieu of things that um, the, all the you know, methods of control want you to, to worry about. Uh, and you know, I really think that this is bad and irresponsible. Um, or you could work on solving these problems. You could actually go into figuring out how to you know, uh, preserve the species, how to back everything up just in case, um, how to back ourselves up, how to you know, move to the next realm, uh, meaning uh, what happens with brain-machine interfaces, what happens with, with uploads. Make sure AI goes right, please. Like Right now, this is a very, very important thing to work on. Um, but you know, uh, sometimes making art about this can have a huge impact. Sometimes giving, giving other people an interest and, and insight into this stuff will help drastically make the change. And I think we have to look no further than the whole Earth Catalog for this. How, many, how much of what we do today is inspired by that movement? So just whatever you're doing, I'm sure it's very important and valuable. Just make sure that it stacks up to this. Um, because if we don't, something could really go wrong. Um, and you know, I considered, hey, telling you kind of like my story about how I got to this, but you know, it's kind of like less relevant. I'll just mention that the stuff that I'm working on is an attempt to go and fix some of this stuff, and, I'll just, and it turns out to be extremely concrete. It turns out to be very, very simple. Day-to-day -day activity can actually have drastic cosmic impact because, again, big things have small beginnings. So I'm pretty interested in on three key problems. The secure communications for huma humanity kind of thing. So this is making sure the internet goes well, uh, or by goes well, I mean continues to, to exist, continues to operate, uh, is safe, makes, um, does not have suddenly borders springing up, which by the way is a looming threat. Uh, and that also means uh, perhaps uh, fully encrypted communications between people. So things like Tor and so on. Uh, the second thing that I, that I uh, really care about and I'm working on is secure computation for humanity. So that means it is very, very important that the com computing systems that we use, which by the way, um, us humans are no longer like our ancestors in the savannas with the tools, uh, with like the stone tools. We have very different tools and we're plugged into these things now. These things are part of us. So, so stop seeing yourself as separate from the devices and the internet and so on. I think it's time that we acknowledge the, the thing that's going on, which is we're integrating into a whole organism. Uh, as a whole, we have built a nervous system over, over the last 50 years. We've plugged ourselves into it. And though it's still really slow, though we still have to type and read and so on, and we have a really bad you know, low bandwidth channel, uh, it is drastically faster bandwidth than before, and it is about to get drastically better as things like VMI hit. So, um, Start considering how you relate to your fellow humans. Stop thinking as much about yourself and think more about the us, because we are becoming an us. Many people would argue that we've, become a, we've been an us for probably a million years or so, uh, you know, in terms of tribes and, and so on. Uh, but I think this is a, a different scale of an us uh, that, we're, that we're forming. And uh, there's, there's stuff around the secure computation stuff that uh, it's very basic, it's very day-to-day, -day. things like making sure that um, when you use a service, it will survive in a catastrophe. So if you can't uh, connect to the backbone of the internet, you should be able to, to work and, and so on. I'll talk about this more later. But that's kind of what I mean. And, and the last one is the secure flourishing of knowledge. And so this is kind of a catch-all for a lot of stuff. Um, and you know, things about uh, better knowledge distribution systems uh, figure into this. Uh, I am obsessed with uh, knowledge package managers being able to, to construct uh, entire memetic packages that people can consume and uh, uh, install and then level up with. So things like that. I mean, book, textbooks, right? Like, talk about a great package manager, right? Like, you just print the thing, make a thousand copies and, and, and distribute it all over the world. And, like, and look back at how, what a kind of tremendous impact that had. So think of better tools, like just, the printing press was a tool. Let's get it very clear. Like that was a simple, uh, maybe not that simple, but a, but a simple to copy um, construction that you could easily uh, spread through uh, through the world and then drastically level up the bandwidth of communications of, of humanity. 
And so think of things like that today. So today we're inundated by bits, so that's not it. We're not, we don't want bits faster. Uh, what we want is the right bits. So maybe when you look at a page, you shouldn't just look at all bits the same. Maybe computers should be able to tell you what's true or not. So when you say, see a statement like, hey, the Earth is flat, maybe the computers are good enough now to be able to tap into some database of collective knowledge to sanity check statements against uh, the, the actual reality that we have. We have. We're sitting on hundreds of years of, of the best method of finding things out. Uh, we, we have the scientific method. We have the data, we have the theories, we have the explanations. Why are we not cleanly plugging all of these things into how we consume information? Why are we letting six, soon to be eight billion people on the planet access tons of information, memes as beneficial and dangerous as we know them to be, and just treating all information equally? This is a pretty big danger. So anyway, I, will, I could probably rant about this for days, so I will. Move on for a moment. <laughs> Perspective setting is probably the longest thing. It's definitely the longest thing. Um, I'll, I'll end soon, even though there's three things to cover. Um, because I think that there is a massive crisis in perspective. I think that today we live in a world with a crisis of epistemology. We don't know what to believe. Most people don't know about science. Most people don't know how they could reason through something and how to learn about it. Um, and so I think that uh, you know, if I could convince everybody in this room to do uh, to do something, I, I hope it is go figure this you know, perspective epistemology problem, help people around the planet learn better and learn the right things and get to truth, to actual um, scientifically verifiable uh, theories. So maybe you can't prove something to be true, but we can certainly prove a lot of things to be not true, and all of those things shouldn't be you know, co-opting and mind-controlling people anymore. Um, anyway. So computing, uh, we are in this crazy phase transition from a you know, pre-harnessing computing species to a post-harnessing computing species. And we've, had, we've gone through packet switching through building of the ARPANET to the internet and the web and all that kind of stuff. And we now are you know, fully integrating with these systems. Um, I'll, I'll just go through the entire history of computing in diagrams really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of those cases where you can pause and ponder. Uh, <laughs> That is, you know, Grant Sanderson's three blue, one brown, uh, math, amazing math videos. Go check them out. Um, I'll go back and explain these in a moment. <laughs> I, all of those that laughed at the last one, I know you know about Merkle trees. <laughs> so I'll explain the last ones because these are the ones that uh, I'm here to explain. Uh, the, the rest of the stuff, um, you can find much drastically better explanations from other people, but I want you to get a feel for, for what's really going on. Most of the advancements in computing can be boiled down to just how can we get bits of data to different places faster or better or more securely, and how can we get functions to be applied to those bits of data to compute other data or other functions, um, again, faster, better, more securely. So in the, in the current uh, you know, kind of Web 3.0 movement that's, that's going on that encompasses both the decentralized web and the blockchain systems, what we're dealing with is this, um, we're addressing this problem, which is we live in, a, in a, an extremely complicated environment where there are tons of different actors that could be malicious or rational, so that's what the green hat is. Uh, it's an accountant's hat uh, where the rational participant will stick with you if you, it's in their best interest, 
but will definitely defect if it's in their best interest to do so. Uh, and the, the, the reason why the word blockchain has such a big hype is that it's an example of a crypto system that takes that very seriously and has been deployed globally. So it's a, it's a system that removes trust from the equation as much as possible so that you can have a trustworthy system where you can reason about the, the operations that you're, um, that you're asking the system to do. So again, all a blockchain really is, is just a ledger of data that we all agree is right, that you're not going to suddenly see a ledger of data that is, that is wrong. And because you know, data is just, uh, because programs are just data, um, you can think of shoving programs into this ledger of data uh, and then running them. And effectively, that's what Bitcoin, Bitcoin did from the very beginning. Uh, it started as an idea of just pointing, um, just keeping an, a method of account, but perhaps having a, a, a venue to import uh, actual programs and having them run uh, is an extremely useful thing. The programs at the beginning just manipulated those, the uh, balances in accounts. But this was a point in the design space that hadn't, it was very different, right? So the throughput of a blockchain today is abysmally bad. So you can, this is partly why all of this development happened not in Silicon Valley, because most Silicon Valley people said, you're telling me an accounting system that is worse than my pocket phone will be, you know, <laughs> will run the economy of the world? This is insane. And, you know, they were right in a, in a bunch of um, perspectives. Like, yes, th that system as is won't run the whole economy. But it's a model, it's a toy system that, ex that works damn well and shows how a much drastically better system um, can be built that run processes transactions across the planet. So that, that's, you know, in, in describing blockchain systems in, you know, in a nutshell, it's really just about having a way to reason about the computation, agreeing, having consensus on the outcome of events, um, and being able to upload your own little programs to have them run. It turns out that that is a, a surprisingly powerful primitive, and what we are seeing today is, is the emergence of an entire range of applications that, that are building sort of a... a uh, are taking this system as, as the basis of a, of a new legal structure in, in computing. So think of smart contracts and so on, where you know, if you think of the, the vast majority of legal contracts on the planet have something to do with moving around um, uh, ownership or moving around or, or setting some terms and so on. And now you can do this entirely in a computer and trust it in a way uh, that you don't fall into this you know, malicious rational problem. You, you can just trust the, the, the computers are doing the right thing. And so this is why this is why there is a ton of hype around the blockchain space, uh, and, so, and so on. Uh, if you're very familiar with cryptography and crypto systems in general, you'll point out that, of course, all of this stuff has been you know, known for a decade and a half. Yes, uh, this is what happens with computing uh, transitions. We find a really good system that happened to punch through the, the, you know, the activation energy barrier, and then everyone rallies behind that system and says, oh, yeah, like, you know, and this is all... Um, it's all part of the blockchain world. And, and you can see this with a lot of the higher, um, you know, there's a number of older companies that are jumping into the space that are really just building systems that they <laughs> talked about decades ago before, um, maybe not decades, but at least a decade and a half, certainly before Bitcoin. And it's really just consensus systems and good crypto systems. Uh, but they're all labeled blockchain now because the, the blockchain movement has garnered such, such strength. Uh, I want to distinguish this from um, this decentralized web stuff uh, which is similar but subtly different. Um, what the decentralized web stuff is about is taking the existing current web computing platform and taking the links in that computing platform and making secure links out of those. Um, so it, it's in a different point in the design space, and it is converging quite quickly to, to blockchain systems. And so the, the, the joke here is that you can think of decentralized web websites or data sets and so on as, as being you know, equally equally sound and equally secure as, as blockchain systems, just in a different nature. So there's no consensus involved necessarily, and so on. If you said, hey, let's take a decentralized web system and put some consensus on it, then I would say you have a blockchain. Uh, it's a way to like, heal the divide between the two. Now, a very significant um, thing that's going on around uh, all of these systems is that uh, they present a, a pretty surprisingly good chance at building secure, robust systems that you can rely on even in conditions where your governments your, your, uh, are against you, um, corporations are trying to surveil you, and so on. And, and so that sounds kind of crazy, but 
But in, but in reality, like what we're dealing with is just weaving cryptography and we, weaving distributed systems theories and ideas into a system capable of processing functions, this is really all it is, processing functions, um, in a way that nobody can interfere with. So if you know that the function applied, then that's fine and safe. Um, I'll, I'll mention this stuff, and you know, I won't talk very much about IPFS. You can find plenty of other talks about it. Um, we address a, a number of interesting, interesting problems. A thing that we really care about is offline. So most people on the planet are not plugged into the computing system the same way that you and I are. They have local networks. They have maybe a, good, a, a very high latency but, um, and very high bandwidth link, say moving a package, like a packaged hard drive from one place uh, to another. But, uh, but they're not constantly connected to the internet the same way you and I are. So we need to change our computing platforms to address this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm proud to say that, that our work has been um, you know, helping in a bunch of these, these conditions. We know of certain communities that are using this stuff in, in offline regions. And we also know that it's being used uh, actively to fight certain censorship things. So for example, the um, uh, IPFS was used in the, in the recent referendum in, in Catalonia. There was a, a, an attempt to, um, you know, this was an example of a Western democracy immediately um, deciding to silence uh, you know, a strong push for, for, uh, for, for voice from, from people. And they just went through to the roots of the internet, uh, to the, to the uh, ISPs and to the uh, managers of, of DNS in, in, in Catalonia and blocked a whole bunch of websites. And it turned out that our system just works even in that environment. And so uh, I was capable of, of moving around information. So there are a whole bunch of other systems like this that, that are being built right now and are, and are getting deployed and need, of course, a ton more work to get there. But, but the insight here is that we are, we are using cryptography and cryptoeconomics, which I'll talk about in a moment very briefly, and um, we're using distributed systems to yield a computational platform that is really native to the internet, is really coming from the electronic frontier, not from you know, the segregated, partitioned, different uh, old world, old world giant uh, model. So, so you can think of, think of blockchain systems and decentralized web systems as, as, a, as an emergence um, that is building a new jurisdiction in the world, which is the internet jurisdiction. Now, how it relates to other governmental jurisdictions and so on is still yet to see. This is a baby thing that's really dumb for now. It's like, think of like the worst possible optimizer you can think of, and that's what it is. Maybe not, not evil one yet. Uh, but but, but that's, that's, the, the, um, that's kind of what's happening. It's, it's a new way of, uh, of getting safe and secure computing. And, and when these things get completely encrypted, then, then you're in a, in a whole different, different ballgame. And you know, a lot of people ask me why, why I'm so uh, pro-encryption. And, and um, you know, it's a really hard question. Uh, there's a lot of people on both sides of the encryption and you know, pro-encryption and against encryption debate that um, maybe don't see the full implications of being on either side. Uh, in, in the, in the anti-encryption side, you see a lot of participants saying, hey, look, we're, we're the good guys. We're trying to keep people safe. We're trying to uh, make sure that uh, no bad groups go around and uh, do anything uh, you know, bad to our societies and so on. So we need to be able to look at everything. We need to be able to wiretap everything. And, and you know what? Like, they're right. Like, when they are the good guys and to a great extent. They work really hard to keep everybody, everybody safe. And they have very legitimate reasons to be worried about bad things going on. As we saw before, like, you know, doomsday index. You know, it's very easy and cheap for small groups now to cause serious harm and damage to the entire species. So naturally, uh, a lot of people who have the mandate to, to do something about it are trying to. But on the, on the flip side, on the other side, there's this massive concern that what happens when those groups change? What happens when a movement as powerful as the Nazis in the 40s rises, takes control of that machine, and now institutes the worst Orwellian nightmare that you could possibly imagine, right? Like, that's why. That's why we need encryption systems. Um, and this, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard. Like this, this stuff is not easy to, to contend with, because you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't. Having fully encrypted systems will allow some bad people to get away with bad stuff. Having no encryption systems can allow authoritarian regimes that are completely unprecedented to this day. And so uh, when thinking about these systems, you have to like, pause and think through what you're building. Because by the way, a lot of people are building a lot of stuff right now 
sometimes not really thinking that much about it, which is, should give us pause. Um, but you should really think through, what are the properties that you want the internet to have? What are the properties that you want to bake into the network, into this nervous system that we're building? And what do we want the rules to be? Like, that's what's getting figured out right now. And if you're not part of the conversation, please join it, because you, this, is, this stuff is uh, going to matter for the next 20 years, a lot. And so I think the, the, you know, the crux here for, for me is you know, what potential negative futures am I trying to avoid? And there is a very real um, bad potential future where the advancements of machine learning, the advancements of surveillance technology, the, the advancements of you know, robotics and so on, empower a small group, not to annihilate all of humanity, hopefully that won't happen, but, but really to control vast numbers of people in ways that are extremely difficult to avert. So think of the resistance groups that we know so much about in the 40s and the 30s. They were able to mount resistances against bad groups because they were able to get information to each other quickly and safely. And, and they were able to do things that today any government would be able to spot. So think of the massive treasure troves of personal information that the big, data, big you know, personal data corporations or the data monopolies, things like Facebook and so on, have collected on all of us. And think of where are those bits of information about us stored. And what did you say? What did you say over the last five years in those systems? Did you say all positive good things about every government or every position? Did you say any bad things about bad groups? What if those bad groups suddenly get into power? What if those bad groups get not only beyond into power, but in a position to be able to find you? Like, that's what some people around the world are actively worried about right now. Beyond it being a theory, it is happening. And, you know, there are some authoritarian regimes where uh, it's potentially pretty bad, and there are others where it's not so bad yet, but it, it, you know, we can see the glimpses of something bad. So, for example, the current credit system uh, that is being instituted in China is a good indication of what happens when you empower a government to look at everything that you're doing and then rate you based on that. What happens to dissent? What's, what happens to different opinions? What happens to the potential of you know, positive change that is against the line of the party? That is uh, potentially very bad. And if you think that this is so far away from us, think again. Um, groups like, you know, again, in the Western, in, in certain Western democracies, this has happened in the past, um, and uh, it could happen again. And we see some indications that even now, we're, different groups are taking cues from how China's managing its internet and trying to apply this to the rest of the world. So there's a, a nice, interesting window right now where we can build really good systems, deploy them everywhere, and then have a much safer, um, much safer computing infrastructure for, for everybody. And now, what are the rules of such an infrastructure? We don't know yet. We need to figure this out. What should be allowed? Should, should it really be the case that anybody can send any other message to anybody encrypted? That's a hard question. So far, everybody has thought yes, and I am very strongly in that position. But hey, you should figure it out, and you should participate in a network knowing what you're participating in. Um, so you know, join the conversation. And uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I've taken way, way too much time on this. Um, I'll blaze through this stuff like really quickly because all of this you can find online. You can pause and ponder. You can pause and look look through, uh, and so on. The, you know, th I think that the biggest thing to me that that people don't talk about enough in terms of Bitcoin and crypto economics is think of the enormous amount of computing power dedicated to the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm not going to explain how it works. I'm just going to point out that this thing, um, you know, last time I looked. It's consuming about as much power as Australia. So talk about the insane level of power that just you know, publishing a paper on the web can have. <laughs> right? So, so you publish a paper on the web with like a good incentive structure and the code. You, know, you have to get there. Uh, and then you get this you know, ridiculous um, uh, thing happening. Right? And so this is, this is powerful human coordination. And, and this is just the, you know, the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Like, the kinds of systems that we're going to be able to build with reasonable and good incentive structures are incredibly powerful. This is you know, what we're thinking about in terms of data storage. It's like, hey, can we, can we take this idea and repurpose it to build the biggest memory on the planet? Can we make like, just ever-present storage for, for everything, for all programs, for all data? for you know, the very valuable pieces of knowledge all over the world? Can we just back up and replicate everything? Uh, and can we encourage just people all over the planet to do this? And so this is the kind of thing that becomes possible when you think with crypto economics. 
And so you know, it's really a combination of economics, cryptography, distributed systems, game theory, and so on. And it's, it's an amazing new field uh, that's going to yield very powerful structures. So one thing that I'll, that I'll mention is credit assignment. So um, I've been recently obsessed with this problem, which is uh, how can we assign credit for the success among the multitude for decisions? So unpacking that a little bit, when you think of an endeavor, think of the blue dot there. Think of all of what it causes and all of the participants that, that influence that endeavor. And think through the potential benefits and punishments that need to be properly uh, propagated through the system. Uh, I claim, and you know, this is like the subject of like an entirely new talk, uh, I claim that, that solving this system for humans, let alone for machine learning, for humans, is one of the greatest challenges that we have in economics in this century. If we get this right, we could rewire our economies to actually do good things. How many people here think that our economies are completely running amok and like <laughs> causing all sorts of damage to the world? Think about like, the environment. Think about, like, uh, think about like, what we value today. Think about like, the, the short-term returns. Think about NASA being underfunded. Think about how much we pay attention to things like the Doomsday Index. Is, is the Forbes list actually an accurate representation of what humanity values? Absolutely fucking not. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but this is because we don't have good credit assignment at all. We, we, all over the place, there's all sorts of leakages where we don't have good wiring of the system. We don't have a nice backprop system set up in place. And then you have to have people at the end, people like Elon Musk, who you know, managed to, to understand the game well enough uh, to amass a whole bunch of capital and then say, hey, look, like I, I figured out the game. I, I, I succeeded at it to some degree. And now I can do something that's really valuable. Let's back up humanity. But that can't be our best way of working. That can't, like, we, we have no hope of surviving if that's the way that we do it. And so I think we really need to step back, think about these problems, and build a, a much better way to, to encode our values into our economy. And, and if we do that, which is totally possible, because again, money is just an invention, uh, if we do that, then we will see just very quickly new, new systems um, optimizing for the right things. And hey, guess what? It's a good time to do it, because crypto economics allows you to test and play with these things. So you know, join us in this kind of stuff. I talk a lot more about this thing in, in this podcast, and there's other, other, um, many other people that, that have been thinking about this problem for a very long time. Um, so you know, join the conversation. And I think if we solve this problem in the next few, um, in the next few years, uh, then it could you know, radically change uh, a lot of the world. So you know, hyper seminar. There's a lot more to say there. Uh, and in, in one minute, uh, I will try to do uh, the section on knowledge, which is that <sighs> we, what's going through my head right now is I, th this is the thing that I care about the most. So I'll just really talk about it more at length in the future. And I'll, I'll just say that the most valuable thing that humans have ever created and, or will ever create is our knowledge. And you, know, you can disagree with me if you want. And, and I think that we don't, we have not organized our species for that yet. Um, and we, we don't think about permanence very well. And so when you think about that, that uh, horrible doomsday scenario of humanity being wiped out, you have to think about the threat models. Do, you, do we care if all of humanity gets wiped out? Uh, of course we do, but you know, what do we want to back up just in case? Maybe, maybe there's a situation where we get ourselves knocked back a thousand years, but maybe we can recover, and like a thousand years is no, not bad. I mean, go, go back to think about that 15 billion year time scale. A thousand years is nothing. But, but it will only happen if we back up our knowledge well. And thank you, Long Now, to, for actually working on it, for being like one of the only groups on the planet that's working on it. Uh, but, but you know, we have to work on this, on this more, because our permanent systems need to be so good that even bad groups can't systematically go and find those caches and destroy them. We have to not only make it insanely expensive and hard to, to, um, to destroy our information, but close to impossible. For example, let's build a satellite, launch it to space, and then have it beam back all of, you know, all of the information. Um, by all of the information, we have to figure out what all of the information we want to keep is. But that's a really good, potentially good system and really hard to, to, to go against. Um, you know, hard to figure out what it is and so on. There's all a all ton of really hard problems, and maybe that's not the best idea, but it's an idea that gets to what I'm, what I'm describing. Um, so we should give digital information print-like qualities. Today, books will survive vastly longer than hard drives. If, you, if you, some cataclysm happened, 
our hard drives would be toast very quickly. And <clears throat> if we didn't get the data out of them quickly enough, then we're going to have to resort back to books. And so we'd have a dark age in there. Um, and this, you know, Vince Cerf and a bunch of other people, and you know, hundreds of people are working on this, but we're not working on this in a very well-integrated fashion. Uh, so we need to. And, and we need to like, take, take these kinds of... Kinds of um, yeah, like r right now, like you know, this is this is not the same thing, right? And so when you have a, <coughs> you have a <coughs> you have, sorry, uh, I'm still like a you know normal biological human, have problems. Um, so the when when digital information, uh, which today you know is hosted at a particular spot, and when you try to view it, like your computer sends messages to that thing, and then it retrieves it real time, and like that's our basis for information management. Um, like that, that's super dangerous, <laughs> massively dangerous. So you know, this is something that we're trying to address in the IPFS uh, project and so on, but we're very far from, from, uh, from fully fixing it. And, and it's going to take a lot of very interesting um, solutions to, to gather up all of you know, the compendium of all human knowledge to try and, and, and safe, safeguard it. And so you know, when we think, I'm going to place through this, just I want to leave you with this idea, which is archiving dimensions. Think of, you know, what should we archive? Think of the public record versus private stuff. Like, private stuff maybe shouldn't be archived, but public stuff should definitely. Uh, should we think of the amount? You know, it's a lot easier to replicate a petabyte, a lot harder to repli replicate a yottabyte. So let's think of, like, the really important stuff to, to back up and, and back it up in a way that is, that is safe against, you know, different kinds of, of, you know, degrees of threat model. Like, what do we want to survive through? Uh, you know, again, you know, the... Are we worried about bit rot? Are we worried about you know, people going and destroying data centers? Are we worried about civilization collapse? Are we worried about extinction? By the way, one of the silver linings and all this like, you know, dire stuff is uh, it turns out that you know, we've generated all our knowledge in what? 10,000 years since writing, 100,000 years since language. Um, it's not that much. So if we go extinct, it's fine. But you know, it's probably good to you know, leave records of who we were and so on for the, for, for the next groups. And you know, think, you know, thankfully, Voyager is out there already carrying that. Um, but you know, I'm particularly interested in this civilization collapse one, because that one is really dangerous right now. And we could make a very significant um, effort to, to prevent this, where um, you know, we could have most of the hard drives on the planet not work. And we could still you know, not lose very many years in our, in our knowledge timescale. And, and so I want to fight for, that, for that, that future. Oh, and by the way, the type of storage media matters a lot here. So when you think about the sizes and the threat model and how you want it to survive, like think of all of the considerations that went into where the, the long now clock is and you know, how, how you got to put it in, in like the right place to like survive for 10,000 years. Like that's a very long time, and a lot is going to happen on the planet. Um, so storage media really matters, um, and, and how you do it. Um, so you know, it's a... Uh, you know, in archiving of, of, of knowledge, uh, right now we're doing just the easy stuff. And if we don't do all of the hard parts of, of you know, this demand, you know, the space, uh, we're, we're in a very precarious position to the point where we could see another collapse like we saw 3,000 years ago. So 3,000 years ago, there was a small civilization collapse in, um, in the Eastern Mediterranean where a lot of cultures kind of um, collapsed very quickly. There's a whole bunch of theories and questions around why. There was a seminar previously about it. Um, and, and we could see another case like that in the future through many of the possible things that could happen to us. And if we didn't back up our knowledge, then we're going to set back people a lot longer than, than we hope to. So in closing, uh, I'm sorry that, uh, that I've you know, taken you through this crazy ride and roller coaster of ups and downs and so on. Uh, you know, people ask me when I, when I talk about this stuff, uh, how can you be happy when you think about all this stuff? <laughs> and, and in reality, I'm probably one of the most optimistic people you, you one of the more optimistic people you'll find, because I have this persp this you know crazy perspective, and I, and I identify with this you know 14 billion year thing going on, and I know that you know overall things are going pretty well, and overall you know we're doing really well for a bunch of monkeys, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we're like doing really well for for most life forms that we know in the planet, and uh, we just have to not screw it up. And we have to push the frontiers and get to better places and try to you know, make something out of this great gift that we have. Um, 
And, and, and the amazing thing is that the world is amazingly malleable. So all of this stuff that we've been talking about, all of these technologies were built by small groups of people, sometimes individuals. Sometimes just a single person playing around discovered something ridiculously powerful that leveled up and empowered all of humanity. And, and with our software platform, it's just that much easier. You don't even have to manufacture the thing. You just have to ship a new piece of code and upload every, you know, upgrade everybody. And so I encourage you to become a cyber wizard because really what we're doing here is magical. Like it's really weaving um, you know, spells. You know, we're typing in our weird languages and, and shooting spells out to the rest of the world and causing crazy systems to, to emerge. Um, and I encourage you to get involved in labs. So this is you know, things like the labs and, and Zero Spark and so on. And, I, and you know, after all, I haven't mentioned open source at all in this talk, and I've got to. Open source is one of the most important changes to how we work that's happened in, in a very long time. It, it has enabled all of us to align, yeah. <laughs> open source or free software, you know, there's different ideologies, but, but a lot of the same shared perspectives. It has enabled a tremendous amount of collaboration and cooperation across international boundaries, across organizational boundaries, across governments. It, it enables humans to just collaborate on things in, in, a, in the digital you know, uh, world, in, in the electronic frontier, in a way that um, you know, just the world of atoms doesn't do at all, you know, not on the same scale. And so you know, I think uh, I, I encourage you to join uh, to, to work on these, these problems. I encourage you to, to think deeply about the stuff that matters most to you, the problems that you want to solve, uh, and I encourage you to build and find, a or, find or build a community that, that is going to work with you to, to do that. And you know, I, think, I think we can totally do it. I think we can totally solve all of these problems that I described today. I didn't mention a single one that I didn't think was solvable, except maybe the von Neumann probes thing. That's kind of scary. But I think everything else is totally solvable, even like the scariest AI problems or the scariest you know, uh, optimizer problems, or you know, the doomsday index and all of that kind of stuff. It's all solvable. And it's just going to take small groups of people. It doesn't even take action of millions. You know, it's up to you. Thank you. Okay, everybody relax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry for scaring we, everybody. We got a little tense there. Um, be a little more specific about your personal work and interests. Um, would you say something about Filecoin, which you've been focusing a lot of time and, and inventiveness on, and sort of how Filecoin fits into the spectrum yeah. you just described? Yeah, totally. So. Um, the Filecoin project is an attempt to weave the crypto economics that I described in terms of Bitcoin to convince people all around the planet to devote all of the hard drive space that they're not using and wire it all, all up together in a cloud storage platform, and then build all of the you know, user interfaces on top of a system like that to enable people to just hire that storage as they would any normal cloud computing thing. So, so think of it as weaving crypto economic incentive structures into a system that convinces people all over the planet to take whatever hard drives they can find, plug them together into a system, and do something useful. Most of the computation in Bitcoin is, is just completely wasted. So in Filecoin, all of, the, all of that you know, crazy exponential uh, of power is useful, valuable storage. And so we're, building, we're trying to build like, this you know, permanent memory for, for humanity. Uh, you know, permanent in like, the short term, or permanent in that it will only be permanent if we keep upgrading the systems and upgrading the media. But uh, we think that if we weave the right incentive structures, we can, we can probably do something like that. As I understand it, the, the Bitcoin mining, which is what uses all that enormous amounts of power, Australia worth of power, is proof of work or things like that, which are you know, part of the functioning of the, the system. And uh, do you then replace that with storage, which is valuable, and then there's somehow an incentive? What's the incentive right. for providing storage? Yeah, so the, the way the Falcon protocol works is that we take the proof of work function, and we found a, this took a while of research, by the way. Uh, we figured out a way to get a good proof of work that uses a thing we call proof of replication. 
It proves that you're backing up a specific file at a specific moment in time. And if you do that correctly, then it's, it's the equivalent of, of, of brute forcing a, a hash in, in Bitcoin. It's, the details are much more complicated. I encourage you to look at you know, Hyperseminar. Go find the paper, read it. Uh, go find like, higher level descriptions, and there's a number of talks. But the, but the insight is just take the proof of work function of Bitcoin, have it do something useful, and in this case, it's uh, backing up storage. Is Filecoin an operating, uh, now functioning system like Bitcoin or Ether or any of those? Or no, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to launch in the near future. Uh, IPFS is a functioning system, so you can, you, you can use that. Uh, Filecoin will be, will be uh, hopefully up by the time most people watch this, uh, but not, not yet. Uh, we hope to be out in the, in the coming months, months to a year or something. And then the interplanetary file system, which, uh, are you the divisor of that or the instigator of it, or what's <laughs> yeah, your role I, there? Word instigator is the best. Uh, yeah, so, so that, and that is a working system you can use it today. In fact, most of our websites run on IPFS. Uh, that system is a way of addressing all content and you know, giving it that print-like qualities and addressing it through cryptographic hashes to be able to find them, uh, find the content from anybody who has a copy. So think about right now of all of the people in this room that have computers, and imagine bits of information that you might want to get that other people in this room might have, or maybe not other people in this room, people in this building, or this block, or this city. Uh, right now, the way that we address information and move it is by going all the way to the backbone and, and back. And so IPFS is a system that just you know, leverages peer-to-peer -peer to build a system like that, and then figures out all the content addressing uh, to slot it into the web. So the idea is that you as a user never see anything change. Uh, it just gets better. Um, and it'll make, it, it's one of the cool things is that it makes offline work. So if today, right now, the internet connection to the backbone here in this building broke, then we couldn't interact with, with each other. Even though our computers are effectively more powerful than um, you know, the entire <laughs> Apollo space program, um, we, we could not work with each other the way that we expect. And that's just because of a flaw in how we built the web. Uh, we built a web in a way that encouraged just the content to go into the, into the, um, you know, into the cloud and encouraged uh, you know, large corporations to run these systems instead of just enabling linking across the devices in this room. So with IPFS, you can build something, imagine like a Google Docs or a chat system, something real time, live, um, and have it work locally. And, and you can have this work in an environment where you know, it's effectively, the difference between being online and offline kind of goes away. Um, Offline, online being, means just suddenly being able to talk to everybody else, but you should be able to interact and have you know, computation with the people around you um, without having to depend on some random server out in the middle of nowhere that you don't know anything about. So where does the concept of content address fit into this, and what is it better than, and why is it better? So a content address is being able to look at a specific file and derive an address from the contents of the file itself. So specific way of doing this is we, you run, you use a cryptographic hash. Cryptographic hash is just a big function that you feed a bunch of information into and pops out a number. And that number is guaranteed to be unique for that content. That number is so big that uh, you will never get the same number for two, two files. Even if they differ by only one bit, you'll never get the same number. That's you know condition of the cryptographic hash. And, um, and, and this is you know, a probabilities thing. I, I will plug uh, Grant Sanderson's video on how big you know, two, 2 to the 256 really is uh, to, to convince yourself that the probabilities of you know, two numbers being the same are, are so low. So we use a cryptographic function to take any piece of content, or you know, really in IPFS, fragments of content, and give those fragments of content addresses. Then we can build files out of those fragments of contents and concatenate all of them together, and you end up with a single hash that represents arbitrarily, arbitrarily large amounts of data. It could be a big file, it could be a directory of files, it could be an entire you know, data set, it could be an application, it could be the data of an application, and so on. And so it, it, uh, uh, when you do that, that address, that, that identifier, does not depend on anyone except the crypto. So you can derive that address, I can derive that address for the same piece of content, anybody else can derive that address. Uh, it doesn't rely on going to a specific server. Contrast that to how it works today. So today, if you want to post a picture on, say, Facebook or Google or something like that, you grab a picture and you upload it to the server and you get a URL that says you know, facebook.com slash mypicture.jpg. And then you can go and give that address to somebody else. But what that means is that those people, if they want to see your picture, they have to go to Facebook servers and ask them for mypicture.jpg. 
Now, hopefully, Facebook is going to return the same bits that you gave Facebook. They could return something completely different. Or the connection between that person and Facebook could be gone. So there's all these problems that emerge out of using addressing that points to servers. And so if you use addressing that points to content instead, a lot of that stuff goes away. You still have to solve a problem of how do you find the content, how do you ma map a cryptographic address to you know, the participants in the network that have that content. Uh, but we have really good routing protocols. Uh, and, you know, we, people have invented pretty good routing protocols. And that's a much, more, much easier problem to solve than, you know, I'm disconnected from, the, from Facebook, and, but I, you know, I, have, I really want to be able to work with people next to me, and I can't. Uh, and is that a fond dream at this point, or is it being instantiated somehow? Oh, everybody can use it today. So it's been live since 2015. Mm -hmm. um, people can go and use IPFS and can build. Uh, there's a, you know, I, I bet that by now, you pr probably most people in this room have at least encountered some piece of content um, that is hosted through IPFS. It's, you know, not, it's not huge yet, but it's getting to the point where it's, I've, I'm seeing it pop into the web in a whole bunch of places. You can see the URL. You can see URLs and you can see the hashes in, in there. And what are some of the pioneering uses that have emerged? So um, <coughs> I think the very first use case was just a lot of people playing around with it personally. Like most computing technology, it was just mm -hmm. hobbyists uh, playing with it and using it to move around their own files. Uh, now it, there's two sets that we think are, are you know, really important. Um, one set is all of the groups building blockchain applications have to address content in a secure way. And they need something like IPFS to do that. They can't address content in, a, in HTTP the same way because it's a different security model. So all of those kinds of applications use IPFS to point to images, to point to contracts, to point to you know, that kind of stuff. The other uh, set that we really care about is what we call large volumes or data sets sharing. So think of you know, really large um, archives of data. So this could be from, you know, in the small side, uh, hundreds of gigabytes or terabytes, and in the large scale, like, you know, petabytes or potentially exabytes. That's a really massive data set. Um, you, you can move around data sets like that using, using IPFS. And so you can address the, all of the content of a data set and, and distribute it. Um, and so that's a, a very interesting, useful, cool use case. Uh, um, let's go out of the weeds and back into doomsday, your, <laughs> your major interest. Um, this must have come online. Toke Fowlby from Denmark says, how expensive is it to make doomsday very expensive? In other words, you know, what's the opposite uh, graph of uh, can this be done cheaply or is it going to cost a trillion dollars to make doomsday cost a trillion dollars? So cryptography teaches us that it's actually quite cheap to build things that are on the other side really expensive to break. Hmm. So I would suspect that we can find a really good ways of of replicating ourselves that aren't, um, that aren't, or not just replicating ourselves, but but preventing them, say, that are that are much better. So this could be this could mean as simple as just changing how we. Um, I think this is very case dependent. So if you think of bio warfare or something like that, the ad addressing that looks very different than addressing nuclear weapons, right? But um, in all of those scenarios, there are probably really cheap ways to address them. It's just more of a human coordination problem. Like when you think about the problems that plague our governments today. They're really not that expensive or that, that hard to do. It's just like a huge coordination hurdle that you can't get people to agree, you can't get people to decide to do something. And so if we figure out how to do that right, we can probably do a lot of this other stuff really cheaply. The question has come up from J. Bryce Midsmith, or a name I can't quite read. He must have written it in the dark. Um, it has to do with elections. And uh, the, the, you know, the worry that people are having that elections can be, uh, the polling places can be fiddled, the people can be fiddled, the machines can be fiddled, the code can be fiddled. How do you make a uh, fiddle-free election process? And is your technology going to help in that? Uh, so it can. And surprisingly, it already was part of an election uh, in a weird way. Uh, so the, the Kalinian, um you know, attempt to, to do the referendum. Um, not quite an election for, for a representative, but it was definitely a vote that was submitted to, to people. Um, in that case, it happened to, our system was used to distribute information of the, where people could find the polls and, and get to them, which was trying to be silenced. So that's an example where, where things can help. Um, definitely getting certifiable information is really valuable. If a polling place gathers the data and got, gathers all of the information, and posts uh, you know, a, a certifiable link to it, um, so you know, cryptographic hash of the data and so on, 
then no other participant along the way can tamper with those results. Um, now, I'm not sure that that's a really the bottleneck. You know, today I think the, the real bottleneck is, is in human systems. I think uh, humans are going to find a way to subvert the majority of these systems. Um, and I think in that case, I think uh, potentially crypto economics and blockchain systems could actually have a, a more interesting angle where you could do things like just incent a lot of people that are either trustworthy or have a really high collateral to pay if any problem happens, is found in an election, and then have a good systematic way of sampling that and checking that they've done the right thing. And so you could build just an, a group of auditors that are paid, re rewarded very highly for good, honest work. And if anything is spotted being wrong, have massive, uh, massive punishment, you know, monetary or, or hopefully <laughs> just monetary. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you can do systems like that uh, with blockchain systems. And I don't think any of them have been, are being deployed yet, but I think we could see something like that appear in the next two or three years. Now, the will to do something like that is a whole other matter. I mean, how, can you, how are we going to convince a government to do that when we can't even convince them to, to like let other you know, independent uh, arbitrators come in and, and check elections or things like that? Well, it's, you know, the, one of the uh, benefits, I suppose, of blockchain starting as a monetary system, Bitcoin and so on, is that the whole idea of incentive got built in from the start. And so realistic incentive, uh, money-based, is part of how you want to do Filecoin, is part of uh, what I hear from the Ethereum people. And so you, know, the, you guys take incentive more seriously than most. Yeah, so I think game theory is probably one of the most important sciences to understand uh, this, these days, uh, because game theory enables coordination of large groups of actors in ways that um, hmm. you know, we don't really do well yet. And and, and I think it's, you know, thanks to you know, von Neumann and a bunch of other people that, that pioneered the, this stuff, um, but I think it hasn't been, I don't, I, you know, I think there's a long way of, of uh, there's a lot more to discover in, in those areas and a lot, a lot of ways to use game theory to, to build much better societies. Now, the, careful though, because game theory can also be used for bad really easily, right? Like you can, you know, for every good use case, you can probably find bad use cases. You can. Somebody, uh, so in this case, we had someone like Satoshi uh, creating uh, a thing to build a payment system that you know, governments can't, can't really control, and like, that's pretty cool. Um, but you could equally have an incentive structure for something quite nefarious. Uh, and, and so it, game theory and the vast deployment of game theoretic systems enables groups to, you know, without revealing their identity, potentially cause significant harm. So this is something we have to be really careful about. And so we're starting to see in the deployment of prediction markets, things like Augur and so on, that <laughs> the ethical contract, being able to check the ethicalness, um, that's probably a word there, uh, being able to check how ethical a contract is, is an extremely important piece of the puzzle. And if you, if you don't do that right, you can yield something pretty, pretty bad. Now, when you couple this with full encryption, that's when things get really scary because when you can have contracts or prediction markets emerge that are opaque and we can't tell what's going on, now that's where you can have some you know, pretty bad and unethical activity happening. So you know, I, I, right now we're in, in a point where a lot of the primitives are being built and people are figuring it out and, and we can see around the corner that a lot of potentially really good valuable things can be built with these incentive structures and incentive systems. But we can also already see a bunch of really bad ones. And so really right now is a time to figure out how we should govern these systems, what the rules of deployment should be, what should we deploy, what should we not deploy, um, how do we know what we're doing. And, and I think in, in this environment, you know, contrary to most other computing you know, revolutions, I think the blockchain systems revolution is drastically much more concerned with governance and, and ahead of the curve than almost any other that I've ever, that I've ever read about. So I have, you know, wasn't around for all of them. Um, hmm. the, but, but it's... But it's still far from, from, uh, from where it needs to be, because I think this one needs a lot more. So even though we're ahead of the curve from everybody else, I think we still need a ton more work to, to really be sure that we're going to deploy really good, safe systems for everybody. Uh, there could be some, some bad things that, that get deployed. So help us out. Get a vote. Yeah, governance keeps coming up. It's, in, it's a really uh, old. Hmm. One of the things that impresses me about this whole blockchain world is the amount of uh, very high-minded uh, focus is put on the whole idea of governance and trying various approaches to make sure that it's ethical all the way down. 
Um, Art W. has a question which um, others have brought up, which is quantum computing looks like it's coming along. And we're talking about crypto, currency and crypto, everything, and quantum is supposedly this great decryption capability. Uh, when quantum arrives, is that it for blockchain? No, I, I mean, there are quantum safe systems. I mean, the current systems that are deployed are, um, I mean, this varies across the systems and what you could do. I believe, for example, in Zcash, I think, I think a quantum computer could probably decrypt the log. Um, but in, in other cases, uh, but, but we already know crypto that, that even will be safe through quantum computers. It's just a matter of, of efficiency. Today, because we don't have quantum computers, Zcash doesn't have that. Um, if they were around the corner, then we, would, we can upgrade all of these systems to be, to be post-quantum safe. Would um, quantum help blockchain? Um, I mean, you could definitely do things like, so one thing that we're interested in is, uh, so, so storage markets is one thing, like what happens when you do computational markets? So um, this is a form of computation that is not like it. So, so Ethereum is one single log and everybody kind of agrees on everything. We're starting to see the first few systems that allow um, more scalable computation models. But, but where this really is going to head is just think of a normal operating system task scheduler of just being able to describe a job and have it be done once or close to once, an expectation once, um, and then get to that degree of efficiency around the planet. And then we'll have you know, markets that run these kinds of computational systems in various degrees of security. Now, being able to plug in a quantum computer to that would be really cool, because then we can run a ton of computations um, really, really well. Around, uh, so just be, being able to enable anybody to use a quantum computer would be really cool. Right now, most of the, the way that quantum computers are going to get developed is only a few corporations or governments are going to get access to them, and that's not great. So you know, that might be a democratizing force. Question from Anonymous. Uh, do you think having such a small subset of the human population fluent in these technologies is contributing to our potential demise? Do you think more people need to learn computer science? Do you think, uh, or what? I mean, you know, the coding is being taught hither and yon, mostly as a, it's a place for an idea for employment and all the rest of it. Do we all need to understand blockchain? Because if so, there's no hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, I think that we're reaching. A time. So a lot of people say that, you know, you can't really be a Renaissance person anymore, and you can't really learn a lot of things. I completely think it's false. Uh, I think today, thank you. A lot of people in this room are successful because they learn a lot, a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So I think we're reaching a point where specialization is going to matter, but I think your ability to integrate across a bunch of different specializations is going to matter more. And so. Absolutely, everybody should know about computer science, but more importantly, everybody should know about science. Uh, and just like how we figure things out, and you know what is like the actual epistemological foundation that our entire civilization is built on. Because when you go out into the street and you start asking people, like I can get, probably guarantee you that 99.99 percent of the people you'll talk to don't really have a good understanding of how to get from hey we made some observations to here's a testable theory to hey this is the body of knowledge that we know is true, and. This is a crisis. I, I think like somehow, somewhere along the way, we got comfortable with the fact that this is going on, and we think that it's okay. And it's not. It's really, really bad. And it's probably going to cause tons of problems in the future if we don't, don't fix this. And I think what's really good about social media, so social media is like this you know, kind of love-hate relationship I have with social media. Because on the one hand, it's you know, every time I look at almost any kind of social media stuff, I just get really depressed and angry. And, and it's because. You know, anger flows through social media much better. I mean, there's a lot, bunch of interesting studies of, of why. Uh, and so we just, we've built this amazing nervous system, and we've tapped into just this kind of broadcast channel where anybody can say anything to anybody else. And the things that propagate the most are just these extremely angry, often fake things. Mm -hmm. um, and so social media just gets us all to be really angry and, and about things that don't even exist, which is, you know, crazy. But on the flip side, what the, the silver lining in all of this is that right now, by giving everybody a voice and creating this broadcast channel, we are now suddenly getting to see all of these different perspectives and, and, uh, and natures, of, all of these different perspectives and levels of understanding around the planet, and, and we're getting to see that, them all in one go. Like this isn't, we don't get to pretend that they're not there anymore. We don't get to pretend that they don't exist or that they, you know everything is you know. Peachy and, and everyone you know agrees on on the very basic facts of life. We are getting to see right now that of the six you know six going to be eight people eight billion people on the planet. Like 
most of them disagree about the basic foundations of, of reality, and most of them disagree about what's true or not in, in very basic, testable things. And this is something that we really need to correct as, as humanity, and we should you know, be working on this uh, and, and working on, on you know, gentle, compassionate ways of doing so, of, of helping people level up, helping people learn. I claim that humans are so good at learning and our brains are so powerful, we could be learning at you know, kind of PhD levels across multiple fields, and I think that this is true about almost everybody on the planet. Uh, I've rarely found people I've rarely found people that, you know, if you, if you don't, like, you know, step back and try, you know, you have to sometimes try really hard to, like, decompose pieces of knowledge into, into something that, you know, they'll be ha happy to accept. A lot of the times, it's just aversion to it. And, and you know, people are super capable. And so I think it's, it's a, a, we need to approach this from a perspective of try and level up everybody on the world. Think, think like Carl Sagan did, right? Like, why did he do Cosmos? He wanted to get everybody on the planet to understand What's going on? And like, we need you know, a thousand more, more pieces of work like that. So last question Kevin Kelly raises. Uh, you use the word we a lot. <laughs> Who's we for you? <sighs> Who's we for me? So I think for me, and I probably used it in a few different contexts there, we for me is, I think probably our, the, the case where it makes the most sense to say it is perhaps our tree of life because um, we don't yet have contact with other trees of life, and I think at that point would be really great to see, or other intelligences. I would, you know, let's distinguish intelligence from life, um, and so that's probably the thing that that I'm most, you know, excited or worried about. Like, hey, you know, the, the Earth Project is going really well, uh, or oh no, like there's danger on the Earth Project. Uh, and so that's mostly what I probably identify with. But, um, you know, I think we're, we're part of something much bigger than that. Even our entire life, uh, you know, the vastness of space is really enormous. Like, I encourage you to spend, like, a week of your life just pondering the enormity of space and just pondering just how many galaxies we know about, let alone might exist. And what if, you know, the, you know, I think four, five different versions of the multiverse that exist now uh, that we, you know, conceive of. Uh, we are part of something so enormously big, that, and, and we are so young. You know, how, how you know, it's, it's, it's a, how dare we think that we have it figured out? How dare we think that, you know, things like the second law of thermodynamics have it all spelled out? We, we barely, we barely just got out of, you know, like, you know, barely just took our blinders off and like, suddenly understand what, what the universe is. Um, and so there's so much more for us to learn, so much more for us to discover, um, and so much potential. Like, I, I you know, it's, it's an amazing, it's amazing to be alive. It's amazing to be part of humanity in this juncture. It's, uh, if I can, if we can do something to help it survive and help it point it in the right direction, that'd be awesome. If we can help explore more, that'd be great. Um, but I think most, most importantly, let's just not screw it up. <laughs> here, here. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.